Good morning and happy Sabbath everyone. This morning I'm going to share with you a message prepared by Cindy Tush entitled Praying in the Last Days. So let's pause for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, please send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds as we listen to your word and help us that we may recognize your voice and obey you. Guide me too as I share the message. Hide me behind the cross of Jesus. In Jesus' name, Amen. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. It reads, Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Imagine the tension. Moses had passed away. Joshua is now the new leader of Israel. And it is finally time to enter Canaan. But the rushing waters of the Jordan River stand formidably between the eastern shores beyond which lay the the vast arid wilderness and the fertile rolling hills of Canaan to the west. How will Joshua get more than a million people across the great Jordan River in its flood stage? Paul tells us that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11 uh, that biblical narratives are written down for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages has come. In other words, the stories of the Bible can provide principles that can keep us strong for the very chaotic days in which we are currently living. What principles can we learn about prayer in the last days from this narrative? One, Joshua remembers what God had done in the past when the waters of the Red Sea parted. Two, Joshua expects to hear from the Lord before he organizes the crossing. Three, Joshua leads the immense congregation in confession and submission as preparation for entering the promised land. Four, Joshua doesn't rush to war with his armed men. He waits for the Lord to reveal his plan for conquering Canaan. Praying like Joshua will prepare us for the time of trouble when Jesus takes us through the waters and leads us into the promised land of heaven. But before we unpack these four lessons in the narrative, that are important to us uh, for the, in the last days, let's quickly review the story. The question is, how will Joshua lead God's people across the river in the flood stage? We will find that in this crisis, Joshua prays, the people pray, and the priests obey. What does Joshua do? in this crisis of not having transportation for crossing the river. He seeks God in prayer, of course. But for Joshua, prayer is not a passive recital of his wants or even his need of guidance, essential as it is. Joshua is accustomed to entering God's presence in prayer as an active listener fully expecting to hear from God. And in the hour of Joshua's extreme need, 
God speaks words of encouragement. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 verses 2 and 9 When Joshua prays, he does not know how God is going to make the passage through the Jordan a reality. Nevertheless, in faith that God will make a way for his people, Joshua begins preparing for the crossing by sending two spies from the Israelite camp to the city of Jericho, a stronghold of Canaanite military might. Upon receiving the positive report from the faithful spies, Joshua instructs the people to sanctify themselves in preparation for the wonder that God would work for them. In other words, their preparation was confessing their sins to each other and to God. They were to seek God's face individually and corporately, allowing nothing to stand between them and the God whom they believed would do great things tomorrow. What a precious time of fellowship, prayer, confession and song the Israelites must have had. That evening's prayer meeting surely was characterized with tears of repentance and tears of joy as the people asked for and received forgiveness from those they had wronged and as well as from God. Joshua's life of active prayer and communion with God energizes the flagging faith of God's weary people. They express their willingness to obey the commands of God. All that you command us, we will do, and where you send us, we will go. Joshua 1 verse 16. In the morning, directed by the Lord, Joshua commands the priests to bear the Ark of the Covenant right down to the bank of the raging river and march into the water. The multitude watches. When all the feet of the ark-bearing priests touch the waters, the tide of water on one side suddenly sweeps back. As the current flows onwards on the other side, the riverbed becomes bare and dry. The priests advance solemnly towards the centre of the channel and remain there with the ark, while the entire nation of more than a million people walk to the western side. Joshua commands 12 men, representing the tribes, to carry a large stone out of the riverbed. Then he commands the priests, bearing the ark, to come on shore. The moment their feet touch the other side, when the ark is safely across the river, the wall of water floods the natural channel of the river. Joshua 3 verse 17 says, Then the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Lesson 1. Prayer opens the heart to God. Prayer is not a duty, a ritual, or a task for Joshua. Jesus was his friend, and Joshua regularly conversed with him, opening his heart to God for guidance, for transformation and fellowship. What can we learn from Joshua's story? He chose to lean on God's instructions. He believed the promise in Joshua 1.7 that through God's strength, he could be strong, courageous, and faithfully observe his law. Then he acted on the word of the Lord. 
Later, Joshua learns through the debacle with the deceitful Gibeonites that neglect of seeking God's will in every circumstance can have devastating and far-reaching consequences. What an example for us. The Bible is bursting with, with the promises of God. He longs to have us grasp these promises, believe that they are intended for us, as well as for the original hearer, and truly expects great things from God. We can pray these promises right back to God's compassionate heart, but instead, we wrestle alone with our dilemmas. When we finally give that burden over to Jesus, recognizing by faith that He is all powerful, all knowing, all loving, we can triumph over our dark feelings. It's a large victory when we finally allow Jesus to be Lord, not just of our lives, but of our thoughts also. Communication is vital in any relationship, and especially in our relationship with God, with the God of heaven and earth. Yes, He knows what we are thinking, but He longs for us to tell Him directly what we are feeling. When the Israelites are roundly defeated at Ai, Joshua falls on his face before the Lord. Now notice God's response uh, in Joshua 7 verse 10. Why are you lying on your face like this? By asking this question, God invites Joshua to verbally share with him what is on his heart. The invitation to share doesn't require us to preach a sermon to God as our response. Sometimes all our repenting heart can manage to cry is, Save me, Lord, or I perish. Such a prayer will be heard always by our Lord Jesus, who promises, He who comes to me, I will never cast out. John 6 verse 37 Have you ever felt saddened by a lack of communication in a close relationship? It can be very hurtful. Since men and women are created in God's image, it also hurts the heart of God when we neglect to talk with Him, when we are reluctant to believe His promises are for us. Did you know that God asks us to discuss everything about our lives with Him? The psalmist describes it like this, My heart has heard you say, Come and talk to me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Psalms 27 verse 8 Think of Jesus as the connecting link between yourself and God the Father. Imagine Jesus hugging you with one arm and while he grasps the throne of the infinite one with the other arm. What an intimate, comforting picture of Jesus responding as we pray. You might not immediately see the outward evidence of the answer to your prayer, but you can be assured that God, what God has promised will be realized when you need it most. When you come to Him in prayer, He will solve your challenges at just the right time and in just the right way for your best good. He is trustworthy. Those who truly commune with God and hear His voice don't just rush through the routine prayer with one hand on the doorknob of their busy life They take time to be in His presence. Our world today faces unprecedented challenges. An old hymn began, If we ever needed the Lord before, 
we sure do need him now. Polarization and division faces our families, our church families, our nations. Painful events impact the way we do ministry, the way we witness and evangelize. Yet, when we seek God, He will help us know what to do in this time of calamity, distress, and conflicting claims. How do we hear what the Spirit says to the churches? Revelation 2 verse 29 reads, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We seek out His will and wisdom through prayer, unhurried, undistracted, prevailing prayer. Mark's Gospel describes the prayer habits of Jesus. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Mark 1.35 Not only did Jesus get up early in the morning hours to pray, sometimes he prayed all night. Luke tells us, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Luke 6, 12 At the top of his day, before meeting trials and challenges, Jesus prayed. If Jesus found it necessary to pray continually in preparation for battle with Satan, and temptations to sin, imagine how much more we need to pray, being sinful, short-tempered, jealous, and unpredictable mortals. Have you wondered sometimes what you would find to talk to God about if you prayed all night? A well-known devotional writer answered this question this way, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot burden Him. You cannot weary Him. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Take to Him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for Him to bear, for He holds up the worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to reveal. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer, no sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant or in which He takes no immediate interest. Psalms 147 verse 3 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. By Ellen G. White, Steps to Christ, page 100. Paul reminds us, do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Lesson 2. Prayer leads to confession and submission. Part of the preparation for the outpouring of God's people at Jericho and God's Spirit at Pentecost included repentance, confession and submission. 
to God and to each other. We can also plead with God that He Himself will search our hearts and show us if anything offensive to Him lingers in our thinking and acting. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalms 139 verse 23, a beautiful psalm. We can pray in intercession for our family, our church family, our government, but perhaps the most important petition we can bring to God is asking not just for sprinkles of blessing, but pleading for the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit known as the latter rain, for our time. Hosea describes this. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Hosea 6.3 Hosea uses the agrarian example of rain to illustrate the work of the Holy Spirit in the last days. As the, as the dew and rain causes the farmer's seeds to germinate, so the rain prepares the crops for the harvest. Although there is no point in our Christian experience where we can dispense with the help of the Holy Spirit. The completion of God's work of grace in our souls is completely dependent on the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who will wholly transform us into the likeness of Christ in character. We could compare the early rain to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the days of the apostles at Pentecost. When those men and women prayed together in the upper room, tongues of fire descended upon them from heaven and enabled them to preach and teach the good news with great power to the far reaches of the then known world. But that event was preceded by lots of prayer Immediately following Christ's ascension, Luke records that the disciples were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Fifty days after the ascension, Luke tells us they were all in, with one accord in one place. Acts 2 verse 1 Today, as we eagerly anticipate the coming of the Spirit in lettering power, we too will put away all differences, all desire for first place, and pray together in unity and love. Then the latter reign of the Holy Spirit will do for us all that He did at Pentecost and even more. This special outpouring of spiritual grace will prepare us for the trying events ahead. Not only will the latter rain empower our witnesses, but it will also strengthen us for even more troubling times which await the people of God before Jesus comes. Lesson 3. Prayer Builds Remembrance After the Israelites crossed the, uh, the Jordan River, with the priests yet in the middle of the parted river. The vast congregation of people watched 12 men, one from each tribe of Israel, and each man carry a large stone from the riverbed to the shore. The 12 stones are set up as, as a monument to commemorate God's astounding miracle. Parents are instructed to repeat to their children and grandchildren the amazing story of the mighty work God performed for His people. 
every time the story is repeated, the faith of the children as well as the parents will be strengthened. This will be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Joshua 4 verses 7 and 8 How will it affect your life if you take a reflective hour or two to begin building your own altar of remembrance? What if you write down 12 times when the Lord has done great things for you and share the stories with your families and friends? As with the people of Israel, we can set up stones of witness, remembrance in our minds and inscribe upon our hearts the precious stories of what God does on our behalf. As we review His dealings with us in our own pilgrim journey, we can declare out of hearts melted with gratitude, What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits towards me? Trials of this, this life will test your faith, sometimes severely. On those days, when you are overwhelmed with challenges, obstacles, heartaches, and even tragedies, look back at the memorial you built in memory of God's faithfulness to you. In your mind, repeat to yourself how God has led you thus far and praise Him for each stone. Let those stones in memory's hall remind you that God has saved your life for eternity. Because He has been faithful to His promises in this life, you can be utterly sure He will keep His promises to come again and receive you unto Himself, that where He is, there you may be also. John 14 verse 3 Lesson 4 Prayer allows God to reveal His plans. The story of Joshua's leadership after the crossing of the Jordan River continues teaching us about prayer. The Israelites have entered Canaan on dry ground through the parted waters of the river, but they have not conquered it. They know very little about warfare. In contrast, Canaan is, inha is inhabited by powerful warriors who know their country well and are eager to defend it with all their might and with all their iron, horse-drawn battle chariots. Deuteronomy 9.1 states that the Canaanite cities were great and fenced up to heaven. The formidable fortresses were meant to intimidate any intruder. The various Canaanite tribes united in a common purpose to defeat the Hebrews who clearly intended to gain possession of the land. Joshua needs help and he knows right where to find it. Leaving the encampment, he goes to the Lord in prayer. Suddenly, a mighty warrior, tall, armed, commanding in demeanour, appears before him. Startled, Joshua challenges. Are you for us or against us? Interestingly, the warrior who turns out to be the Lord himself doesn't identify against either group, but puts himself above all the inhabitants of the earth by stating simply, I am the commander of the Lord's army. The Lord reminds Joshua, as he had done years before with Moses, that the very ground on which Joshua stands is now holy. Filled with awe, Joshua falls on his face and worships. 
Joshua doesn't come to the Lord with a plan for the capture of Jericho. He doesn't request approval with a rubber stamp. He simply wants to know the will of God. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? Joshua 5 verse 14 How often we come before the Lord with a preconceived plan, a shopping list of requests or ideas of how to accomplish a mission that we are hoping God will approve. To fall face down before God in total reverence and submission to anything He might command is rare. But the story becomes even more unusual. God outlines a mind-boggling strategy for a human. Joshua and all his fighting men are directed to march silently around the city of Jericho once a day for six days. And after each singular march, the soldiers are simply to return to the camp. As Joshua continues listening to the Lord, the instructions for day seven must have sounded even more bizarre. March around the town seven times, each man blowing a ram's horn. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. How might you have you responded to those directives? Would you have sputtered? What a recipe for mockery! I'll never convince my men to do such a thing. The Bible tells us very briefly and clearly just how Joshua responded. And Joshua did as he was told. Joshua 5 verse 15. The outcome, of course, is exactly as God predicted. The walls of Jericho fell. The men of Israel charged into the city and annihilate its inhabitants. The word of the Lord comes to pass. Joshua's faith and obedience is rewarded. This is how our prayer must be in the uncertainty and challenges of the last days of human history. We must have a deep and living experience with God that will enable us to hear and recognize His voice and carry out His commands, no matter how unexpected those directives are to our usual way of problem solving. Prayer is heaven's plan for success. Our heartfelt prayers of need and faith move God to action. Let's learn how to pray. Let's pray much more than we have in the past. Let's expect great things from our God of compassion and mercy. Let's pray in faith and, re and leave the results with God. Soon and very soon, our prayers to a God we see only through the eye of faith will become praise to a God we can see face to face for all eternity. Look, the Lord our God has shown us His glory and greatness, and we have heard His voice from the heart of the fire. Today, we have seen that God can speak to us humans, and yet we live. Praise God.